Welcome back everyone. This is N3FJZ with more work on the ZX SSB2. Okay, in this video I'll be starting construction work on the RF power detector, which is a Stockton bridge. And the output of that bridge will be uh, sent or connected to the Arduino's um, analog inputs. And with some math, I uh, should be able to calculate the uh, forward power, the reflected power, and SWR. And I, on my TurboCAD version 6 here, I've laid out how that bridge will be built and it will be uh, contained in a uh, RF type box constructed from 0 0.013 inch or 0.33 millimeter thick tin plated steel sheet and I've also laid out the box components and I've printed those patterns out here and I'll tape these to the, uh, the steel sheet cut it out with tin snips and then bend it into a, uh, a box very similar to my power tap here, which uses the same technique, solder it all together. Or of course you could use circuit board material to do the same thing. I just happen to like working better with the tin plated steel sheet. And I'll have a link where you can get the sheet if you're interested in doing it this way. But the circuit board material is probably a lot less involved if you're not into the uh, folding, cutting out and folding the sheet into a box, so forth. Okay, I've uh, taped the patterns to the uh, steel templated sheet. I've cut them out. Here you see I've punched some of the holes and nibbled out the larger hole for the, uh, the coax connector. And I'm in the process of bending this around to make one of the sides. And I bend them with these, uh, these benders here. So that's what we have so far. Okay, I have all the uh, parts cut out and the holes are punched and the components are bent. And the next step would be now to uh, solder together the box and uh, start installing components. Okay, the next step is to uh, solder down the, uh, the Manhattan pads 
And I also have two uh, homebrew terminal strips here that I made from, uh, I guess it's perforated uh, fiberglass board and some uh, 22 gauge wire. Okay, and they're going to they're going to go inside the box here where I have these little marks scratched into the base of the uh, tin plated steel, and they'll they'll hold up the uh, potentiometers and the other components that are in the uh, Stockton bridge here. So that's the next step. And I use a, uh, I guess you would call it a modified Manhattan construction technique where I take a uh, hole punch and I'll put the link for that hole punch on the site and also uh, below the video. I punch these out one eighth of an inch and then instead of gluing them to circuit board material, I go ahead, I'll go ahead and actually solder them to the tin plated steel on the bottom side. <clears throat> and then I tin the top side and that's where the uh, components will go. Okay, I have the um, Manhattan pad soldered into the enclosure now. And I have the uh, terminal strips and the RF connectors and then one of the baffles is tacked in. Um, I'm not going to solder it in permanently. I want to see if there's any problem getting components in there with that in the way. Uh, if there is, I'll pull it out and then solder it back in. Well, anyway, um, so I have all the components ready to go. And I have both 1N34A and BAT81 diodes. I want to try each one of these to see if there's a difference. And I'll probably try uh, generic switching diodes too to see if, if it's even usable as an experiment. But when I'm done, I'll, leave, I'll probably leave one of these two types in the uh, finished product. Okay, I got the two transformers wound and the uh, coax cables made up for the uh, each each one each side of the bridge. I'm going to start with 13 turns and uh, take off if additional turns if I need to based on experimentation. Okay, here's the uh, coax and the transformers and a dry fit before I solder everything up just to make sure everything fits in the box. Okay. Okay, I got all the wiring done, and everything's installed in the box here. And I know it's hard to see with all the reflections, but hopefully you can see some of the detail. And I soldered. 440 nuts to the corners, inside corners, which will allow the cover to be uh, attached. And everything is uh, all boxed up and soldered up here. a better view of this thing here. And I have uh, adjustment pots. holes in the cover so I can adjust it with the cover on. 
Now I found out that um, with these pots fully clockwise, which would produce the greatest output, um, I get around 5 volts or something a little under 5 volts at 50 watts. So it's probably not absolutely necessary in this particular application when you're feeding it into an Arduino because you want to approach 5 volts drop across the, the resistors here. Now I have 13 turns on these current transformers. I guess if I took a turn or two off of them then it would produce more voltage when dropped across the 50 ohm resistors and actually what I use is two 100 ohm 1% uh, resistors in parallel to give me 50. And come through the uh, back of the unit or bottom with uh, capacitor, uh, feed through capacitors. And I have an inductor here, just probably not necessary at HF. But I had them, so I stuck them on there. And of course, the lid. And if I've done this correctly, the lid would have been more RF tight. As it stands now, there's a gap around the corner. So again, for HF, it's probably not all that necessary. Now, if this were microwave or very high UHF or VHF, yeah, you would probably need to do some sort of RF gasketing or overlap or something. Okay, and there it is all boxed up with the cover. Again, there's the adjustment holes if necessary. I may do some testing and take a winding off or two of, of the transformers. I'm not sure yet. So, there it is. Okay, here's a test setup uh, where I'm running my uh, ZX SSB2, the output from the 50 watt module, 50 watt PA. <clears throat> and. We're going to come in on the left side here, come out on this side, go out to my, uh, my dummy load. Okay, what I was doing was I had a scope across the output and I'd measure the uh, peak to peak volts and then log the uh, voltage on the output of the uh, power detector and plot it. The differences for th the three uh, kinds of diodes, one in 34 a a BAT-81, and a generic 1N4148. And plotted those guys out. And uh, somehow I'll get this up on the website. But um, I was a little, uh, I was uh, kind of surprised with the one in forty one forty eight wasn't all that bad. And let's see, that would be the black line. And you know, there's some slight differences, but it seems the biggest difference between the three diodes is that the one in thirty four A, which is the uh, the purple line, uh, starts to produce output voltage at a lower wattage level and so below one watt you start to get output where the other diodes you had to get significantly above um, let's see what was it five milliwatts even though it's not written here but the one in 34A did produce output down to 5 milliwatts, where the other, the BAT-81 and the 1N 4148, they were at 0 volts, and as you climbed up, you would get some output. And you really didn't start to produce decent output until you got to about 1 watt. So I guess the moral of this story is you could probably get away using uh, 1N 4148s, you know, if you're going to be QRP levels, you know, two, five, 
10 watts and if you get up into the 50 and 40 uh, 30 and 40 and 50 watt level uh, there's not I mean you do get a usable output so I wouldn't uh, hesitate building this even if you only had the one in 4148s because you would get some usable output and it would be usable probably not as accurate as the uh, 134As at the lower values. So that's how I tested this. And like I said, it's uh, not very scientific. Uh, I'm not out for any extreme precision or accuracy. It's generally, it's just an indicator. And the goal here, of course, is to use the output of, that, of this module to drive this screen right here. where I can have um, watts forward, watts reflected, and um, the SWR where I could do it, you could actually tune your antenna match uh, based on the screen here.